expect to be this far. What we are going to do, once all that stuff's out of the holes, is we'll go back and we'll take a closer look at those souls. It's incumbent on us to let the public, especially those individuals that live in the immediate area of this laboratory, to let them know where we are, what stage of the cleanup, how much longer are we going to be here. I believe that the EPA is going to the full depth of this when they get to the very bottom of it, get everything cleaned up. They have come to a complete trust with Team Flora. We've become part of the community, the community's become part of us, and uh, again, that, that whole team concept has overflowed from the site into the community. The relationship forged between the people of Newport, Tennessee and the cleanup team at the Flora site proved that a community faced with a major hazardous waste site in their backyard could work productively with EPA. In fact, cooperation has made the unenviable process of sampling, treating, and disposing of over 700 damaged gas cylinders and thousands of suspect chemical containers a success for Team Flora. We have sort of a motto here at the site and it's called Team Flora and it's an adage we picked up early on and it maintained that meaning throughout the entire cleanup. It's been a long, arduous road. That road began at the former Rock Hill Laboratory. Opened in 1959 as a Cold War era research and development facility, the 15,000 square foot building housing 12 labs changed hands a number of times through the years until Flora Chemical was established in 1988 to manufacture specialty gases. As a result of a 1999 inspection and the failure of management to comply, EPA shut down Flora Chemical and began a removal action in April of 2000. There were thousands of haphazardly stored chemical compounds, many of which were classified as deadly or shock sensitive. One lab in particular housed over 1,600 chemical containers with many incompatible materials stored adjacent to each other. Geophysical surveys on the 53-acre parcel also revealed lab packs containing PCBs, phosgene cylinders, and other glassware buried in sinkholes around the site. 11 container cylinders here, better inside the warfare agents for fluorescent on top of this, inspectors discovered 23 cylinders of perfluoroisobutylene, or PFIB, a chemical weapon with no known commercial application. When inhaled, PFIB attacks lung tissue, causing painful injury or even death. We found shock-sensitive materials stored next to acids. We found weapons of mass destruction that were stored in a garden shed. Team Flora went to work evaluating and categorizing the waste streams. Initially, cylinders and chemical containers were assessed to determine how they could be handled and stored. To efficiently sample and hazcat the materials, existing labs in the main building were modified to allow pH, oxidation, flammability, and air reactivity tests. To protect nearby residents during operations, EPA's environmental response team performed perimeter air monitoring. In the unlikely event that a release or fire did occur during sampling, an early warning system utilizing an air horn was installed. The fire was our biggest fear, these chemicals being so unstable and so reactive. Uh, if we had a fire, we wanted to immediately uh, let the public know uh, what was going on. The U.S. Coast Guard strike team was on board for additional safety support and site documentation. The team also served as a federal presence in the absence of the EPA on-scene coordinator. For the risky assignment of cylinder sampling, 
work was performed in fully encapsulated Level A personal protective suits. Well, to work in Level A uh, generally means that you're dealing with, with a substance that's pretty nasty or you're not real sure about. Level A work is arduous, it's cumbersome, it requires a great deal of, of support and planning on the front end. You just don't hop into a Level A suit and go to work. The method we used here involved a five-man team, and that was to expedite what we we're uh, handling. Initially, the first step is to assess the cylinders, whether they're even safe to handle or to store in their current condition. After cleaning the valves and grounding the cylinder, a custom stainless steel sampling manifold was attached and the exacting process of sampling each of the 700 plus unknown cylinders began. As each sample is taken, um, you have a certain very small volume of the gas, the unknown gas, that is extracted into a manifolding system. Once we have charged or partially charged the sample chamber, we're ready to actually extract the sample. We use special gas sampling syringes to do this. One syringe then remained in the sampling lab for HASCAT testing, while the other was delivered to the on-site analytical laboratory. A support team played the crucial role of ensuring the safety of anyone entering the hot zone. During level A entries, an additional rescue team stood by in case an emergency situation developed. I couldn't ask for a better group of people. I've got some of the best uh, technical know-how behind me uh, that any OSC across the country could want. Uh, and, you know, if it wasn't for that level of expertise, we certainly couldn't get this job done. In the event a cylinder valve was inoperable and couldn't be sampled using the manifold, cryogenics were utilized. If the cylinder or container was beyond the use of even cryogenics, it was placed in a pressurized sampling apparatus dubbed Kilroy, where it could be safely breached, sampled, and then treated. Another existing lab was modified to serve as an on-site analytical laboratory. Samples were transferred to a technician via a sealed glove box and were then analyzed using FTIR and gas chromatograph mass spectrometer instrumentation. With the on-site lab, sampling teams could have full analysis within 20 minutes, allowing samples to be segregated safely into groups for later treatment. For the shock-sensitive chemicals, which had gone beyond their recommended shelf life and couldn't be transported off-site, the team conducted control shocking. Shocking these, we would generally get an energetic effect and a resulting fire or small detonation. The resulting fire from those, we controlled using normal firefighting techniques, uh, also to minimize the size of it and allowed them to react off. Because the bulk of the waste was halogenated organics and many cylinders were not DOT shippable, Team Flora opted to treat much of the waste on site. The first treatment system designed on site, Elvira-1, or the E-1, was intended to treat PFIB, the weapon of mass destruction. As best as we could ascertain from various governmental sources, there had never been a successful, accountable treatment of this material, so we were up to quite a challenge here on this site in that we had very limited information. In the E1 treatment vessel, the PFIB goes through pyrolysis, which is a chemical change brought about by the action of heat. The process causes fluorine to be removed from the carbon chain, as well as decomposing the carbon chain itself. Then through hydrolysis, water vapor is introduced to form the more manageable byproducts, carbon dioxide and hydrofluorine. The hydrofluorine is still dangerous, so it's injected into a reactor of calcium hydroxide. The resulting reaction neutralizes the hydrofluorine to form the waste product calcium fluoride, which is essentially table salt. The only byproduct then being safely discharged is the carbon dioxide. The Elvira system proved so effective with the PFIB that our site leadership decided to treat the other 
halogenated organics that we had on site, which accounted for approximately 200 cylinders. Because of the high yields achieved by the E1 system, Team Flora designed and built the larger E2, which had an identical treatment system, but could now treat up to five cylinders at once. The stepped-up system allowed the remainder of halogenated organic cylinders to be treated in a period of five weeks. To treat acid gases, Team Flora once again designed and built their own treatment system, dubbed Heartburn, mostly using components available on site. The Heartburn system utilized a 5,000 gallon stainless steel tank situated at the bottom of a natural sinkhole to prevent any vapor drift in the event of contaminant failure. Inside the tank, a pump circulates calcium hydroxide. The acid gas is introduced and reacts with the solution, is neutralized, and forms calcium salt and water vapor. The calcium salt collects in the bottom of the reaction vessel. Any residual vapor is pulled off the headspace and sent through a secondary treatment tank where it is scrubbed with sodium hydroxide before being safely vented into the atmosphere. Also placed in the sinkhole was the Thermal Destruction Unit, or TDU, which through the combination of thermal decomposition with air scrubbing, treated off-spec flammable gases and residual gases not pulled from cylinders by E1 or E2. Because the main structure which housed the laboratories at Flora was contaminated beyond any practical decontamination, it was decided to raise the building. I think everybody was looking forward to uh, seeing these buildings uh, destroyed. We didn't bring in a lot of specialty equipment. We just have a track uh, loader with, a, with a, a demolition bucket that can grab and move things around. We have a track excavator that has a thumb attachment. A thumb attachment is more of a gravity and a weight thing and that it just falls up against the other bucket as you pick things up and they're quite a bit uh, less expensive. The team still had to deal with the buried waste scattered in pits around the facility. Because of the site's history, the potentially shock-sensitive waste was excavated semi-remotely. We're using a large excavator with blast shield protection, essentially trenching in increments of six inches. When the waste is uncovered, uh, myself or another competent individual that has a lot of experience with identifying waste will make a call as to whether it is handled at all uh, by human hands or whether the excavator does all the handling. If the team suspects that containers are shock sensitive, the excavator methodically unearths the waste and places it in a specially fabricated stainless steel box on a crush table. Suspect containers are then crushed with the help of the modified excavator. We have an acid gas react, these doors are immediately closed, and we have a vertical counterflow scrubber that we manufactured on site that connects to this and will treat these gases. The accomplishments made by Team Flora during the two plus year cleanup were impressive. Literally thousands of cylinders and chemical containers were sampled, hazcatted, and treated, all on site. But no matter the task, the number one priority was safety. Not only the safety of the community, but the safety and well-being of personnel working every day, handling the myriad of containers and cylinders. What initially seemed like an insurmountable task concluded safely and successfully. When I first became involved with the cleanup here, I characterized the site as a sleeping giant. The way I look at that now is that you know, we got our hands around that giant and we dealt with it and it's not the big threat it was a year ago. But that is a direct function of surrounding yourselves, you know, with experts, thinking through problems, and teamwork. And all those elements came together here at Flora seamlessly. And we're looking forward to going home here real soon.